In terms of that, well, apart from
wonderful occasion. Um, I'm very pleased indeed to be able to welcome you here. Uh, it's a, a privilege to do so primarily as the uh, Dean of Education, uh, out of which faculty these books have arisen, uh, but also, of course, as PVC and the person responsible for research activity within the uh, university, I'm very pleased to uh, see these uh, further signs uh, of excellence. Uh, the event is entitled the, the UK Coalition, Politics, Culture and Education, uh, as that encapsulates the themes of the two books that we're launching uh, through this event and also reflects the strengths of the three speakers that we have with us today. Uh, very timely event, of course, given what's uh, about to happen, because our event does celebrate uh, the launch of these two volumes, and that is very much part of the contribution that Hope is making to discussions uh, ahead of the general election and the end, at least, of the present uh, coalition arrangements uh, that are in place. I have been asked just to say uh, just a few words, and we are very tight on time, so I'll keep it extremely brief uh, by way of introduction uh, to our speakers. Uh, Mike Finn is well known, uh, I suspect, to pretty much everybody in this room, uh, one of our own colleagues here, an academic at Liverpool Hope, trained as a historian uh, and teaches within the education faculty. He is the editor, uh, co-editor with Sir Anthony Selden of one of the books, uh, The Coalition Effect, and also the editor of The Gove Legacy. In 2006, he was head of research and chief political speechwriter to the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the transition between Charles Kennedy and Wynne Campbell. He's also worked very closely with Nick Clegg during the period when Mike was responsible uh, for preparations leading up to Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's question time, so certainly very well versed in the kind of uh, discussion that's going to take place this afternoon. Uh, Rory Coonan is, is chairman of Design for Care and the founder of NESTA, that is the National Endowment for Science technology and the arts, and a contributor to one of the books, that is The Coalition Effect. Its breadth of knowledge and expertise in culture and the arts is, I am reliably ensured, unrivaled, and he, has an honorary, he is an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, and works up by him are presently, as a photographer that is, are presently on display in the National Portrait Gallery. Our final speaker, Louis Coiffet, I was actually advised not to try to pronounce the last name, but I've given it a go, uh, <coughs> is a contributor to the Gove Legacy and former head of research at the Pearson Think Tank and the founding chief executive of NAHT Edge, that is a new professional association for middle leaders in schools. And Louis has a decade's experience in education and educational policy and has previously worked across government. He is chairman of the Hackney Governors Association and is a trustee of the University of Westminster uh, Students Union. So an exciting lineup. Uh, I say unfortunately our time is fairly short, just uh, 10 minutes or so each and then time for debate and discussion which we're very much looking forward to. And because I know how these things work, I would like to just take the opportunity to thank uh, Michelle Pryor on all our behalf for organizing the event because I'm sure things will fizzle out at the end, so I'll do it now. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll hand over to Mike at this point. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about politics in general, the first element of the three. But before I do that, I do have to do the Gwyneth Paltrow bit, only without the tears. So I do have to do a little bit of thanks myself, purely because, I mean, firstly for this event that it's happening at all, and to reiterate thanks to Michelle and her team that Kenneth has mentioned, but also to the photographers, to the AV team that are working with us today as well, and everybody else that's been involved in putting it together. I won't say much about the acknowledgements to the, to the books because clearly they're in the acknowledgements, but some things that I do want to acknowledge, firstly are the two speakers that are here today. Thank you to them for being here, to Rory and Louis, uh, both of whom have very busy schedules and have joined us. And just a couple of shout outs. I do need to thank Kenneth in particular and also Eileen, his personal assistant, because without their support, neither of these books would have come to fruition, and not least because they gave me consolidated research time, which was very generous of them to allow me to bring these projects to a conclusion. Um, I also want to thank Constanza Spora, who's in the audience now. She's a contributor to the Gove Legacy. She's not speaking today, but she wrote what I think is, is an absolutely outstanding chapter on, um, on 
access and aspiration in schools to higher education. I'd urge everyone very strongly to read it, and also buy the book, um, which I have no interest in whatsoever other than to get you to read Constanza's chapter, obviously. On that, on that note, um, there are other people I want to thank just very briefly. I also want to thank Hope Kilmurray, um, who is my research assistant who's here today as well. Now, moving off the thanks and getting into the meat of it all, we don't have any books to sell today, but we do have discount codes. So if anybody's in the audience and wants to buy a book, there are flyers out there with discount codes for both, and they're reasonably generous. So onto the substance. What are the two books about? I mean, The Coalition Effect is an overview of The Coalition. It does exactly what it says on the tin. The Gove Legacy is an in-depth look at education under The Coalition. Um, and it's perhaps one of the key areas in policy terms where The Coalition really did have a definitive effect, where it did something substantial and lasting that will be with <coughs> us for a considerable period of time. Just to make some general points about Coalition, you know, it confounded expectations in some ways. You know, many people have written, both ourselves in, in this volume, in the coalition effect, but also more broadly, about how people in 2010 did not expect a coalition to go five years. Well, it did. Um, it did. It proved a stable form of government in purely parliamentary terms. That was not expected by many commentators. And one thing that also confounded expectations, although I would argue, and I do argue in the book, misguided expectations, one thing that did confound expectations was the formation of a conservative liberal democrat coalition at all. Um, many people could not see that happening. Many people saw the Lib Dems as close to the Labour Party, as a party of the centre-left, and did not anticipate that the Lib Dems would do a deal with the Tories. And actually that fear, or that, 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 cons or that, that belief rather, was most profound actually within the upper echelons of the Labour Party, who believed that there was no circumstances under which the Liberal Democrats could do a deal with the Conservatives. And um, those expectations were misguided, obviously because they did, um, but also because of the fact that those of us who were in the Liberal Democrats in the period in the 2005 Parliament knew pretty well, actually, that we had become politically much closer to the Conservative Party in policy terms, but also strategically, that we had positioned ourselves in a way through successive leaders. There were three leaders in the 2005 Parliament that had put us closer to the Conservative Party. So it wasn't such a shock to Lib Dems, it was a shock to others. Um, the coalition had an effect on both parties. It damaged both parties. I write at length about the impact the coalition has had on the Liberal Democrats. And many of you will be looking forward to May the 7th and be expecting a Lib Dem bloodbath. And if you are and you've got your popcorn ready, you're probably going to get it. So don't be, don't be too surprised when you get that. The extent to which the bloodbath will actually be a bloodbath is open for question because the Lib Dems have very good ground game, very good campaign and strategy on the ground. And more Lib Dems may cling on than you <laughs> might expect. But the story that isn't often told is the extent to which the coalition actually damaged the Conservative Party. Um, we know about things that happened under coalition which hurt the Tories. We don't tend to reflect on them at great length as a connected narrative. We talk a lot about UKIP, but it's not just about UKIP. It's also about internal dissension within the party, the weakness of Cameron's leadership over his party rather than the government as a whole in the past five years and the problems the Tories have going into 2015 being able to offer a united, unified narrative. We are in the beginning of an era of multi-party politics. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. I don't think that's something you'll be shocked to learn. Um, it's not so much of an effect of coalition. Coalition is more a symptom. Phil Cowley, at one of the events we did for this at the LSE, the Professor of Politics at Nottingham, pointed out something that most students of British politics know, which is the share of the vote um, to the two main parties, the two traditional main parties, has been declining since the 1950s pretty consistently. So this was always going to happen in the end if that trend was followed through. But it's going further now. It's going further now. You're seeing more and more parties competitive in more and more places, and, are, and obviously you've got the SNP phenomenon in Scotland. Um, that's having an impact, and that, that, that's having a severe impact on how the election is playing out this time in terms of what parties offer. So a coalition effect or a long-term effect of the decline in share of the vote on this election has been the nature of policy debate. I mean, I was, I was speaking, to, speaking to someone yesterday who was talking to me about how kind of apathetic they were about the policy offers. The policies looked like they were cooked up in five minutes. There's an element of truth to that because of the fact that the policies um, are negotiating points. No one expects to win a majority. So the manifestos are not the same kind of manifestos that even we did put together, the Lib Dems did try to put manifestos together, um, back in the day. You know, they are not the same beast that they were in 2005. The Tories did a very detailed manifesto in 2005. So did, the, so did the Labour Party, so did the Liberal Democrats to a greater or less extent. They're not the same. They're negotiating points. And that's why you have even more sound by policy now than you did previously. 
Um, if we just talk about education briefly as a policy area, Louis is going to talk about it in more depth in a moment, it's, it shows that actually even in a coalition where there is division, it is possible for one minister with an agenda which is more or less coherent ideologically to push through a set of objectives that are dramatic. Um, whatever you think of Michael Gove's work at education, and I believe many people in the audience are probably fairly cynical about that, um, it's nonetheless the case that he's probably made the biggest impact on the British education system than any Secretary of State since Anthony Crossland in the 1960s. Crossland introduced comprehensives and effectively go have destroyed them. So, you know, you see, that's just a take school organisation. It is still possible under coalition through parliamentary sovereignty and the power of the executive to do dramatic things. It just depends on how convinced your minister is and how much power they have relatively within government, within parliament, and Gove had a lot. So where are we going forwards? Will there be another coalition? Will there be multi-party government? It changes from day to day. No one can confidently, Nostradamus style, predict to you what is going to happen on May the 7th. There are too many tight marginal seats up and down the country to be able to say that. There is not going to be a uniform swing nationally, for there never truly is. There are going to be swings of different natures in different places. But what I think is potentially going to happen, and this is something I want to throw out there as, as a concern, is this is a great election for political geeks. It's a fantastic election for people like me who like sitting up there on election night and coming in bleary-eyed, I'm sorry, Kath, um, the following day because we want to see the results and so on. It's not a great election if you want to see continuity of government and you want to see the things the British Constitution traditionally takes very seriously um, in terms of stability. Because not only are we unlikely to have a majority, we're unlikely to have a stable coalition in quite the way we were able to manage last time, whatever you think of the current arrangements. We're likely to either need a multi-party coalition or a minority government, all of which is something that Britain isn't used to at all. At least we've had a precedent of a stable coalition. We'd be going back to sort of February 1974 territory, and that was not exactly the greatest era in British politics. So it may well be the coalition negotiations, if there is a coalition after this one, take longer. I think the key point to bear in mind is, and this is a plea from a former Lib Dem, a disaffected Lib Dem, is that maybe the coalition and maybe the aftermath of the coalition with the rise of multi-party politics proves conclusively that our politics now, the diversity of our politics, has outrun our two-party election system. And maybe we do now need electoral reform so we can have coalitions negotiated in a proper fashion as they are in Europe. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Rory Coonan, who's going to speak specifically about culture, which is a topic that really bridges the coalition effect in which his chapter is published and also touches on some of the themes of the Gulf legacy. So thank you, Rory. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, uh, Mike referred to the coalition as confounding expectations. Others might refer to it as that confounded coalition. Um, my tutor at Oxford years ago, Terry Eagleton, used to say of the Liberals that it was no surprise that those who stand in the middle of the road tend to get run down. And uh, how right Terry was. Um, but anyway, I'll, li I'll leave Mike to his private grief. Uh, my job is to try and get us on to a bit of territory which everyone uh, forgets. And I don't know whether you saw the television debates last night. Um, I did. And um, I, when I was watching it, I didn't... Um, I wondered whether any of the members of the panel there, Clegg, the rest of them, had read Churchill's essay on rhetoric written when he was just 23 years old. That will be 1897, for those of you with a good head for maths. Um, a meeting of grave citizens, said Churchill, is unable to resist its, its influence. From unresponsive silence, um, they move to grudging approval, and thence to complete agreement with the speaker. The cheers, he went on, the cheers grow louder and louder and more frequent. Enthusiasm increases until uh, it is convulsed by emotions they are unable to control. Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't detect anything of that kind on television last night. But the event certainly proved one thing that Churchill said in the same essay. Uh, every orator, he wrote, means what he says at the moment he says it. And I suspect that in this election, the public strongly suspects that they will all mean something else at another moment. So the recent coalition is over, but we're entitled to say, what did they mean by it? And in relation to the arts and cultural policy, we, we can add a further question. Did they mean anything at all? An analysis of the evidence, which is 
contained in this fine, excellent book, chapter 16, I recommend to you in particular, on page 440, um, <laughs> analysis of the evidence shows how the British talent for muddling through prevailed, and uh, how making the best of a bad job uh, was accounted a, a success, and how it turned out that despite, some would say, their worst or their best efforts, not a single cultural institution of any national standing was liquidated during the coalition. But it was, as someone said in another context, a close-run thing. And the fear, uh, nay the likelihood, indeed perhaps even the certainty, uh, that this will occur in the next parliament, I think cannot be denied. And this is because the coalition's policies since 2010 have created the perfect conditions for this to happen. And the reason is simple. Of all the areas of unprotected spending, the, the softest of the soft underbelly of public expenditure, it, it lies in, in, in the arts. Other areas of public expenditure uh, that enjoy statutory protection of libraries, take libraries for example, alone of all cultural activities, libraries enjoy the protection of the courts. And since 2010, many libraries, as many of you will know, have closed, but the courts, when challenged, have tested merely the provision of a basic library service, not the number and distribution of libraries. And for the rest, including the great municipal galleries of, of England, including the Walker here, Primo Sinter Paris, one of the greatest uh, museums uh, in the country, in my view, they are effectively defenseless against what is to come, whether it's another unholy alliance of Liberal Democrats and other parties remains to be seen. But when local authority budgets are cut to the bone, it's not surprising that councillors, local councillors, elected members, will look to make savings from these unprotected areas. And who can blame them because of their statutory responsibilities, statutory duties to look after the most vulnerable and unprotected people in our society? Uh, they will have to make choices, and these choices are invidious. So, to address Mike's theme, how did the coalition create the conditions for what I think is to come? And everyone is clear there are going to be significant cuts in public expenditure. Nobody's saying what, but you can imagine that this sector, the arts and culture, having the least protection, as I said, will be a prime candidate. What happened in 2010? Well, it's very simple. A 50% cut in the Department of Culture, Media and Sports own pay and rations, its own department structure. Uh, it emasculated this department. Uh, its ministers were divided up with another department, the Department for Biz or Business. Uh, the, those that remained enacted a 30% cut in the grant in aid to all museums and galleries and performing arts institutions in this country, the largest cut in public expenditure since the creation of the Arts Council in 1945. So what, what, else, what else did they do? Well, they cut down, they closed down, they destroyed, in effect, many non-departmental uh, in, institutions and organizations. And some of them had been flagships of new labor, such as, I don't know, the, the, the Commission for Architecture, a great creation of Tony Blair, uh, gone, but it lives on vestigially in the Design Council. And at the same time, and here's the paradox, the coalition insisted, the coalition agreement, I should say, insisted on free public entry, free public access to the very institutions it deprived of funds, which is a peculiar and uh, perverse thing to do. At another, or any bet that this gap would be filled by philanthropy as the economy improved or allegedly improved uh, was certainly not made explicit and it certainly not proved a very good bet. And the reality is that councils and local institutions have done very well, as here in Liverpool, to replace the shortfall of public investment. They've responded to what we might say to the new age of networks as the old age of hierarchies declines. And nowadays, uh, you know, only looking at my own children's behaviour, culture is always on. It, it remains an unstoppable force uh, since creativity persists whether governments have lots of money or none. So if the next coalition, if we're to have one, and I suspect I have a strong feeling Mike would, 
welcome such a thing, since it's the only way the Liberal Democrats are going to have any kind of uh, presence at all if they survive the car crash, which Mike has successfully predicted already, um, uh, then if, if we are to get any kind of policy from this coalition, whatever it may be, um, it must insist that its tithe of public access, which I think is a good thing to do, that, that by willing the ends, a government should also will the means. And yet what has been so conspicuous by its absence is imagination when applied to the sphere of, 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 of culture. And it's remarkable how little the government has done to try and create policies to, as it were, amend its own uh, sins. And I think what's amazing is that almost accidentally other things have happened that they could not have predicted. For example, the big lottery fund, a branch of the lottery, uh, has emerged since 2010 as one of the most munificent, um, rich beyond the dreams of avarice, uh, more benign even than Croesus, um, with a fund of around a billion pounds a year to spend. Who on earth could have predicted that this small department of the lottery would end up running most of charitable giving in this country? How did this happen? Well, you couldn't make this up. What happened was that the poor paid out of their taxed income for the leisure pursuits of the rich. You really couldn't have made that up. As the economy declined, and here's the obvious example, uh, as the economy declined and as real wages fell, the sales of lottery tickets, no, they didn't fall, they went up. Because the poor spend more of their income on gambling, and that's you know, well known. So the big lottery fund, having seen a share of its money cut and redistributed to others, suddenly found itself rolling in money as its share of lottery income increased. So there was a kind of redistribution on the margins of public expenditure, because we're talking here about very tiny sums of money in the scheme of things. And the coalition might reasonably have said, what is there not to like about this? There is no extra burden on public expenditure, and yet more things are happening. So to conclude, the picture, although I would say uh, has been uh, damaging to what we might call loosely the arts. In many ways, there have been compensatory, uh, there have been compensatory gains, if you like, and museums and galleries and institutions have found other ways of plugging the gap. But it can't last. And my point today, finally, is that the manifestos, if you read them, I don't know why we should bother reading any of them, since it turns out they're all made up uh, again uh, several days later in response to Twitter feeds. Uh, which indicate that certain cert changes of policy might be uh, congenial and desirable. But for what they're worth, the manifestos have absolutely nothing to say about the arts. Labour wants to set up a committee, an astoundingly ambitious thing to do, you might think. Um, uh, everyone is in favour of public access, just as we're all in favour of apple pie and motherhood. And everyone is absolutely terrified of saying anything which would commit the government, any government, to an increase in public expenditure. So I don't want to end on a sour note, but I think the coalition has kind of muddled through, but the Liberal Democrats in particular have failed to advance the case for the arts, even though at the beginning thank, it was thanks to them that the government had an arts policy at all. Thank you. Louis? Um, before I speak, I just wanted to say something about the other two people at this table. I've never met Rory before, but Nesta, which he founded, has had a really positive influence on my career. Um, it does an amazing range of exciting, forward-thinking things, and I think it's a real testament to what it does that it managed to survive the kind of bonfire of the Quangos uh, and to guarantee its future. So I was meeting one of their employees just yesterday. Oh. Talk about some kind of crazy futuristic stuff. Um, and Mike... Uh, we overlapped slightly uh, while both doing postgrad uh, education. Uh, he was the kind of old dog of town on the way out, and I was the kind of naive new boy. Um, and he's always been a very mercurial character, so it's nice to see he settled back in Liverpool and doing something so relevant and timely as this. Um, and it is timely, isn't it? Uh, producing that coalition effect book this moment, I think it is a quite a momentous uh, occasion for us. Um, I won't talk too much about that, but my contribution was to the other one, the Gove uh, legacy, and I'll pick up a few kind of themes from that. 
um, and I wanted to ask you a few questions and then we're going to go into Q&A, aren't we? Um, but I, I think just by way of context, I've had to hot foot it over here from uh, the National Association of Head Teachers uh, annual conference. Uh, head teachers love to spend, well, all teachers seem to love to spend their bank holidays together <laughs> for the whole weekend in a conference, <laughs> usually moaning about stuff, let's be honest. Um, it's a slightly strange uh, uh, thing, so I'm, I'm there, it's my second one. Uh, I've only been in the post about a year, so my first week was at the first one I went to, so I'll be there with them all over, over the next uh, two days, which is fun, because you kind of see them in their natural habitat together, whereas I think most people only ever meet one head teacher. I have to talk to hundreds of them all the time, uh, <laughs> which is fun. Um, but I mean, one of one of the we talk about before I talk about my chapter. I mean, one of the themes of our conference is about the effect of austerity on schools. So, in terms of the coalition effect and the legacy of Gove, um, whoever was in power, some difficult choices had to be made for sure. Um, but I think schools are often now picking up the pieces of some of those choices, and perhaps some of those choices weren't the right choices. I mean, probably don't have to say more than that. Uh, we did some research from members which found that about £43 million pounds worth of uh, support has been provided for schools off the books because they're picking up the pieces where other local services can't. So the cuts to local authorities, social services, healthcare, you name it, often it's schools, it's teachers, it's school leaders who are the kind of local champion in their community and picking up the pieces. What does that mean? That means when kids come into school you have to wash their clothes, put them in new clothes, you need to bring them a pack lunch, you need to teach them how to brush their teeth, you need to pay for a haircut, things like that. So everything that we talk about at a very macro level in terms of the government and coalition, what that means on the ground is usually felt by teachers first and it's school leaders over the next uh, government, whoever it is, that are going to have to deal with a smaller budget uh, in real terms. So they're going to have to make some very difficult choices about how they help those, uh, how they help the people who need it most. Um, slight segue, I guess. Although Nick Clegg uh, will only ever be associated with um, tuition fees, I think one of his biggest successes is the pupil premium. Uh, I'm a, also a governor of a school in Hackney, and you can see the difference that makes for the disadvantaged students. And I think that is a, a good legacy that probably he won't be credited with as much as he should be. Uh, but yeah, wherever the Lib Dems go, they'll always have that. Um, a couple of the themes from thinking about Michael Gove. Um, I mean, let's start by doing a very quick poll. How many, can we do quick hands up if you're currently a teacher actually teaching in a school? One lady at the back, hello. <laughs> uh, same question if you've ever been a teacher. There we go. And then how many of you are about to be teachers? Hopefully, a couple there in the middle, great. And then how many of you are kind of currently academics or were academics? Brilliant. Okay, just to understand my audience. So, I'm not going to kind of ask you the first word that pops into your head when I say Michael Gove. <laughs> <laughs> but that laughter, that nervous laughter, probably <laughs> means it was rude. <laughs> um, and I think that kind of, to me, that explains his biggest kind of mistake, really, is that he completely lost the entire education sector. Uh, not man for man or woman for woman, but for the most part, he lost them. The changes he was trying to make, it almost doesn't matter whether they were the right ones or not. Um, I actually think some of them were quite good, not all by any means, but he lost the argument. He didn't make the case and he lost the profession. Um, and I think in the process, I think teachers lost out as well. And I mean that in a slightly roundabout way. I think that um, Gove's effective firing, um, a lot of the teacher unions claimed that was a... Um, that was a real victory, and in some ways it was, but unfortunately the kind of years of spats between uh, the Secretary of State and the teacher unions, I think nobody came out well out of that, and I think schools and teachers in particular um, have fared worse overall. I think the profession is damaged and is regarded worse as a result of that. If you ask a parent or somebody on the street, a member of the public, um, I think you would see a, cha a negative impact of that kind of very vitriolic debate between the unions and Gove at times. Um, because often it wasn't about children, it was about lots of other things to do with pensions and tests and all these other things, but it wasn't about what was best for children. Um, and I think some of that got lost and people lose interest and they lose a bit of trust in the profession as a result of that. Um, what we're trying to do at EDGE is kind of almost counter to that, is trying to build up the profession and make them 
uh, as capable and confident as they, as they can be. Uh, Edge is a new section of NHT just for middle leaders in schools, which is a slightly weird term, I appreciate, but it's kind of subject coordinators, uh, heads of year, people like that. Uh, and the reason I was hired and the reason that uh, a 118 year old uh, union has invested a million pounds in this big project is because all the traditional forms of support were falling away. And the research they did with that group of people, middle leaders in schools, often they've only become a middle leader because they've been a teacher for a while and they've shown some talent. They get lumbered with more and more responsibilities before they know it, they're head of a department, they're the SENCO, they're a literacy coordinator, something like that. And often they've had no training or support. They don't understand the theory or the research around that bit, the managing and leading. They're still, still spending most of their time teaching in the classroom and they're probably very good at that. But then suddenly they've got a team to manage and they need to do someone's appraisal and they need to have a difficult conversation with somebody or they need to reach out to another school. And that bit was missing and that's kind of why an association after all that long history has decided to do it itself basically. Um, and I think universities have got a particularly powerful role now um, despite the challenges that you've been up against uh, it's not as if schools were the only ones uh, impacted by the last few years I think universities have a really powerful role to play for teaching for the profession departments like this uh, they need to make sure that we get the profession we need in the future because at the moment they're with all the budgets at best flat uh, a lot of the resources and a lot of the expertise uh, is at risk, I think, and I think universities really do have a, a kind of important role to play over the next few years uh, because there isn't going to be cavalry or big schemes coming from anywhere else. I think we need to, to rely on you guys a, lot, a large amount. Um, one silver lining of those difficult budgets, uh, we're not going to see any more sweeping change in education. I'm going to predict that. Um, whoever uh, sits in uh, sanctuary buildings at DfE uh, in a couple of weeks they're not going to have a lot of budget to play with. They're going to have to make some difficult decisions for sure, um, but we're not going to see any grand schemes to mess with the curriculum or other things, especially from the centre of government. Touch wood. Uh, you can quote me on that. Um, so Michael Gove's legacy, the coalition effect. Um, time will always tell, and I think I started my chapter by saying that. Um, it's, always a, it's always a bit worrying when you start thinking about a legacy so quickly. Um, I particularly enjoyed, I think, both... Uh, Wayne Rooney and Michael Owen started doing their autobiographies when they weren't even in their 20s, which I always find a bit bizarre. But I think time will, will tell on, uh, on Michael. But for me, the number one thing is that he lost the profession. Uh, and in, the, in, in that process, he lost the argument as well. Thank you. And now we were free to take questions from the floor. So if you could, when you're ask for the question, if you could state your name and just say who you're directing it to, that'd be great. They need warming up always. <laughs> well, can I just say that I'm not a Lib Dem? I need to get that out there. I think it's very important. This is all Anthony Seldon's fault, and if he's not watching, I know he isn't, but I need to get this said. Um, I'm not a Lib Dem. I haven't been for five years. I resigned from the party. I've actually tried to keep my politics quite quiet in, in, in academic circles due to the fact that I've been doing this book, but um, I'm not a Liberal Democrat. So in response to Rory, may I stress, I hold no brief for them and frankly do not care what happens to them after the general election. So good luck to Nick. I'm sure he'll, be, he'll do very well, and I'm sure there's a seat in the House of Lords waiting for him. So happy days. Yes. Next. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for your uh, presentations. It's Phil Bamber from the Department of Education Studies. Um, I think each of you referred to austerity, austerity at one point in your, in your talk there. And I wondered how we've come to the point that this narrative of austerity has, has been sustained and won by the coalition government. Um, when I look at education, I look at a lot of money that's been wasted in the last five years. For example, the introduction of free schools that haven't, um, haven't actually endured in any way. Um, and I just wondered if you'd maybe just reflect on um, how that argument has been won by the coalition government. Louis, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, I think it was won quite a long time ago. And if you remember, it feels like a long, it does feel like a long time ago. If you remember the kind of that period after the election when nobody was quite sure what was going to happen. Um, and I think since then, Labour hasn't effectively made the argument that that could have happened on anybody's watch. Um, and I think that the coalition successfully uh, argued that it was Labour's fault and they let that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that put them on the back foot and the coalition on the front foot. And then that allows George in number 11 to be able to, um, 
to push through what is effect effectively a political uh, argument rather than an economic argument. And I think that's what uh, austerity is. It's a way of cutting public services to create a society that you imagine. I, I don't think this uh, so-called argument on austerity has actually been won. I don't think it's, it's over. I think that um, um, the idea that Britain is a corner shop which must balance its books on a Sunday night, otherwise it cannot open on Monday morning, a legacy of Mrs. Thatcher, uh, is ridiculous. And money has never been cheaper. Uh, some countries are now paying other governments to lend their own money. Money is extremely cheap. So borrowing to invest, a, a very good Keynesian proposition, as announced the other day by Martin Wolf in the very good piece in the Financial Times, um, this argument is a very live and current argument. It's not the argument of austerity at all. And um, uh, if you remove the corner shop metaphor, then there is everything to play for, for a new government to borrow prudently and prudentially, to invest in infrastructure, in the things that um, we all need. So I, don't, I disagree with the premise of your question that somehow this argument on austerity was one. I'll just um, very briefly just build on what L Louis said in a sense. With Labour, I think with Labour, um, those of us who know Labour reasonably well, I think the reason Labour have proved so, if you pardon the expression, impotent in opposing the Conservative narrative, particularly Conservative narrative on austerity, is because it just reactivated the, the, the kind of Thatcherite um, rhetoric about the 1970s and you know, Labour economic incompetence. It played to a much older narrative of economic incompetence that even New Labour, to be honest, picked up and celebrated when it was in office up until the crisis, you know, that old Labour couldn't be trusted with the economy, etc. So um, I think part of the problem was Labour were uniquely badly positioned rhetorically to be able to deal with it and then lacked the political will to contest it. I think, I think Labour spent far too much time in 2010 picking a new leader and the infighting associated with that rather than trying to do something about the economic narrative. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing as well is actually there's a critique of austerity from the right, you know, Fraser Nelson people in The Spectator, who actually argue that what we've had isn't austerity, that um, what we need is actually more swinging austerity, more swinging cuts than what we've seen. And we're likely to see that on the other side of the election. But to just take Rory's point, um, you know, what you're really seeing here is macroeconomics by anecdote and comic strip. That's, that's really what it is. And you know, if you look at Paul Krugman's arguments consistently over the last four years, there is absolutely no reason in a purely economic sense where, which, where this narrative can't be contested. But I think a lack of political leadership on the part of the Labour Party and um, vernacular understandings of economics that have proved very popular with the right-wing press in particular have been part of the reason what you're talking about has persisted. Legacy. Um, do we need this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because as somebody who was working in school um, up until Christmas, I, I would wager that the, the, probably the, the bigger impact on the classroom teacher has been the Wilshaw legacy. Mm. Um, and I'm just interested in the, the um, obviously Gove and Wilshaw kind of have this on again, off again relationship. Um, and I just wonder to what extent. Um, the, the, the impact that's being felt in schools, y yes, you know, things with the curriculum and school structure are, are, are Gove's legacy, um, but does the book look at the impact of, of, of an, um, a kind of newly invigorated uh, Ofsted on, on um, ch children and on teachers? Well, I'll just deal with the book, but then I'll turn to Louis on Ofsted. But the book does deal with Ofsted, yes. There's a chapter by Brian Lightman. Um, the General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders, where he addresses specifically the influences on, on state schools. Um, and Ofsted features fairly prominently in that, and in several of the chapters too, actually. It's not, there's not one chapter on Ofsted, but it does come up as a recurring theme. Just on Wilshaw specifically, um, as you say, on-off relationship, you know, he was name-checked by Gove in a speech, famous speech that Gove gave in 2009, a year before Gove took office. You know, as the head of Mossbourne Academy, who'd done all these great things and so on. So clearly, there was there was there was a connection there to start with, and there was an, you know there was a willingness to, to bring him on board. And clearly, there's been friction in, in office. And um, the reason, the, actually, just on the title, the reason we went with Gove Legacy. I mean, we did consider Gove Effect, but then I start thinking there's too many effects going on here, and also I think you know it's just going to get confusing. But uh, but I think the issue with Legacy was actually there's so many things that Gove did, and you're quite right. You know, the, you know, Offset have had their own legacy, and Wilshaw has had a distinctive legacy. But specifically, the thing that was in the foremost in my mind, to be honest, looking at it as a historian or school reorganisation, purely because 
there's been basically three big waves of school reorganisation in the UK in the post-war period. You had 1944, which effectively, effectively, de facto established the tripartite system, grammars, sec mods, and, and um, technical schools. And you had Circular 1065, which didn't found comprehensives, but encouraged them and essentially established the norm of comprehensives. And now you've got this. Now, of course, this is actually an evolution of, an old, of a Labour set of proposals, and even going back to the 88 Education Reform Act, some Tory proposals. But Michael Gove academised like no tomorrow. And I think, um, you know, the, the phrase I use in the book is that after crossing the tide was set fair for comprehensives, apparently irre irrevocably, after Gove, apparently irrevocably for, for academies. And as Louis intimated in his previous response, it's unlikely we're going to see a massive turn in back of the clock. So that's why we went with that. Louis might want to speak to Ofsted a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it is still the number one thing that occupies head teachers, particularly. They see their careers really on the line there and their livelihoods often and they often don't trust the process there's um, a lot of variability in inspections there's no independent complaints procedure um, there's some issues around that um, I don't think school leaders are against inspection or accountability but what we've got at the moment is creating some very perverse incentives I would say I think Ofsted has kind of overstepped the mark a long way under Wilshaw it's determining policy uh, it's making very uh, micro level decisions it's a regulator. Its job should be to go around and say, is this good enough or does this need to improve? And it should be that simple, a binary judgment. They're not the, uh, the arbiter of what excellent look, looks like. That's a job for the profession itself with university support. That's not the job of a regulator. I think it's got massively overstepped what, what its role is. And what we've got now is head teachers who are completely terrified and focused on that rather than what's best for their kids in their school. Um, so I think the accountability system we've got at the moment is, is broken. I'm moderately hopeful. I, it feels like Wilshaw's kind of messed up a bit, if I'm honest. And I think that change is coming to Ofsted. Who, who the government is will determine the nature of that change. Um, if it's a right-leaning government, then it'll be more kind of data-heavy and accountability through those measures. Um, I'm a bit more hopeful if it's a left-leaning government that it might be a bit more uh, profession-led and a bit more uh, kind of peer review type uh, assessment, uh, uh, inspection and accountability because that's the most effective way. You can use the parallel of uh, what happens in your classroom, what's the best way to teach. It isn't to tell little Johnny or Jane in the corner that they, uh, they're a failure. You need to work with the schools and the children in them and the staff from where they are and build them up from there. And our current system doesn't allow for that kind of s slow, messy nuance, that process, which is what the learning process is like. Hi. Um, sorry, I, I, I thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear what, what you all have to say. I'm Jane Moore. I'm the head of the School Teacher Education here. I just wanted to uh, reflect slightly on what you were saying about the fact that as we all know, teachers, often quite new into the profession, often have an awful lot of other things that they have to do. And I think it's also very right, and, and we take this very seriously, that we in our, um, the way we form teachers need to have all of those things in mind. One of the difficulties we're facing, of course, is that the wider debate has been, a, uh, has been to schools saying, actually, you don't need universities, um, schools can do it all. So there's been that sort of swirling kind of rhetoric going around. And what's... Um, occurred to me as I've attended um, a, you know, events in, in Westminster and so on around this is that there doesn't feel to me to be a concerted, a concerted sort of um, voice or argument against that and that certainly has seemed to have been the opinion of, of others that I've spoken to across the political <coughs> spectrum. I didn't know what, uh, whether you had any views on that across the panel. Well, I'm, uh, this is not my, this is turning it's like a teacher's event. Um, so let me uh, offer a disinterested perspective. Um, and I'll, I'll use the cultural industries as an example. That phrase, the cultural industries, was an, in, an invention of new labor. And it's, it purported to describe the economic benefits and advantages of doing creative things, painting pictures, making sculptures, uh, all of which is jolly good. But it has little to do, very often, with the motives for making art. And by analogy, uh, as someone who considers himself reasonably well educated, um, I was educated at a time when the purpose of education had nothing to do with employment, nothing at, at all. Uh, it was seen 
uh, in a direct tradition since the 18th century, in the case of my university, or probably the 17th century, as the disinterested pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. And whether you became a lawyer in the Middle Temple, which is usually what people became, or a, or a prime minister, in the case of my own college, uh, several of them, um, was by the by. It wasn't a reason for doing it. And I think in relation to education, what has happened is that so great have been the political pressures to articulate every pound of public money in terms of economic benefit created that we have lost sight of this rather old-fashioned idea that education might be just for the pleasure of being a civilised, well-behaved citizen. And uh, although that seems a terribly unfashionable thing to say, although looking at your faces, I detect a measure of sympathy, if not support, for this proposition, um, going back to that will be politically impossible because so wedded are our cultures and systems to measurement, whether it's Mr. Wilkes or anybody else, or Sir Michael, um, it, it will be impossible to retreat to, the, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a kind of prelapsarian age where knowledge was valued for its own sake rather than for the sake of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So I fear you're probably fighting what I would consider to be the wrong battle. I think that's helpful, isn't it, to kind of broaden the picture a bit. Um, I mean, the education system is becoming more kind of instrumentalist. You know, the language and the metaphors are all kind of pipelines and outputs and things like that. To quote another Sir Michael that I used to work for, Sir Michael Barber, his big idea is efficacy, which is a mm. phrase he's borrowed from uh, the medical profession, which is about student outcomes. And it's laudable in some ways, you know, we should care about what happens to our students, what they can do. Um, but that I think we, we're at risk of, on the one hand, losing the sense that education is a little bit different to that. It's not a kind of inputs in, outputs out. There is a certain amount of magic that happens in the middle. Um, but also I do think the profession sometimes maybe leans too much on that. Mm. I think you can play the game of efficacy, of outcomes, of Ofsted, and it is often a game, but at the end of the day, you as a teacher, you know what's best for your students. And you, if we can design a system around you that works with that rather than kind of distracts you from that, then I think that's potentially powerful. Just on, just on the kind of roots into teaching, we were talking about it just before, um, where I, I'm also a volunteer in Hackney, where I live as a uh, chair of governors in a federation of six schools, three of which are a teaching school. Um, and talking to the head of the teaching school, uh, A, she has no idea what's going to happen long term to her budget. There's no sustainable uh, plan there, for, and they're, they're a very impressive school, um, how they're going to be able to have a long term kind of teaching school uh, business model. Um, but they do quite value the variety of people they get now. I think there's five different routes, you're going to correct me, four or five different routes now. They've, they've been quite smart. They haven't jumped in, what, in all with one. They work with the IOE, and they have a, a selection of people from all the different routes into uh, teaching, and they see value in having that whole mix. But um, the one that they like the best is the one they get to try before they buy, which is the salaried, the salaried route into teaching. So it, sh it, should, it certainly shouldn't be replacing or damaging our higher education uh, provision of teacher training, if you think about uh, the challenges we've got um, for just getting enough teachers in there in the first place, let alone quality, let alone middle leaders, let alone senior leaders, just sheer numbers is a challenge, especially in some subjects like maths. Um, it shouldn't damage that, it should be additional. So the school route may be right for some people and may create some kind of particular types of teachers at the other end, but it shouldn't be in either or. We've got time for one more question. Anybody else? We all done? I'll just add one thought then to what to what Louis said, which is just um, going back to Jane's point, but also going back to what Rory said about um, we can't go back to a prelapsarian, non-quantitative age of accountability. Um, you know, I think I think Rory's absolutely spot on, but I think some of the research that I do is is on political economy, basically. It's on how governments think about the world and see the world now. Mm -hmm. Political ideas are, are constructed in economic terms, and I think. Mm -hmm. This discourse, the knowledge economy, that many of us, if not all of us, are extremely familiar with, which speaks to what Rory's talking about to a large extent, and particularly creative industries and so on, the idea of the knowledge economy. It's not a British idea. It's not one that was invented in Britain. If anything, there's, there's links, strong links to Austrian economics. There's links to Japan, obviously, Peter Drucker, lots of people who are associated with it. But 
I would say that within the British context, this is what my research is basically on, under the British context, the idea of the knowledge economy has a particular resonance and takes on a particular guise because the British have a very empirical strand in their thinking at the risk of becoming incredibly subjective, going back at least as far as Locke. You know, they're, 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 there's, a, there's a great faith in empiricism as opposed to theory within Britain. Um, and on that basis, I would suggest that British culture um, has always been vulnerable to the idea of, um, of Mr. Gradgrind, of facts alone are wanted and the quantitative nature of things. I think it's been amenable to that. But also there was a particular catalyst in British history, which was um, a small thing called the Second World War, where um, British state found itself under an existential threat, came out of that war bankrupt, and then realised that it still wanted to maintain a world role when it was, I think it's the eighth or ninth largest island in the world and was massively indebted. And the, that meant that British politicians in particular, much earlier than some other countries, believe it or not, despite the nature of the British education system, turned towards human capital as an answer. You know, actually, if we fix people, then maybe that can be our unit of resource that allow us to compete with the Russians and the Americans. So I think this has got a longer history than people realise. Um, but it's only been in recent decades it's been meshed with neoliberalism and then been forged into this kind of unquestionable gospel that it must all be numerical. But I completely agree with Rory that um, getting beyond that and getting past that and trying to speak to another idea of what these things should be about or another way of discussing outcomes, to use the phrase that Louis brought in, is, is probably beyond us. And on that cheerful note, <laughs> um, I will leave it. But if I, if I can just um, if I can just thank everyone, for, I mean Louis and and Rory for coming. Rory, um, oh, so is there one more question? I've right? got a plug. Louis's got a plug. Um, Louis's got a plug. Um, with Edge, because it's brand new, we only launched in September. We're probably not going to do the whole um, uh, bank holiday weekend thing. But what we are doing is just today, we've got an afternoon of free training and inspiring speakers for um, any middle leaders or senior leaders who want to come along. And it's free. It's at the arena at the Albert Hall. Uh, inspiring speakers include Tristram Hunt um, and uh, my boss, <coughs> Russell Hobby, the general secretary, and another chap I've forgotten. And then we've got a session on influencing. But I encourage anybody to come along for some free training. Yes, yeah, so just down um, the conference centre down by the King's Dock, basically. Yeah. Um, if I just just finish by thanking the guys, didn't mention Rory's story, which I meant to mention, which is that Rory's uncle uh, is Monsignor Bernard Doyle, mm -hmm. who's actually a key figure in the foundation of this very university. So Rory has a connection. He's been here several times before, at least. So this was a kind of a sort of homecoming of sorts mm. for Rory. So it was great to have him back here. And thank you, Louis, as well, for making such a time to be with us when you've literally got to fly back to the King's Dock in about three minutes. Thank you all for coming, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.